Capital Planning Control meeting that is being conducted with members and officers at various locations, communicating via audio, video, and online. There's also the opportunity for the public and press to listen and view the proceedings via our YouTube channel, and you're all very welcome. Before we start the meeting, I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer, Matthew, to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members, officers, and registered peace speakers are in attendance. Thank you, Chair. So um, as the uh, Councillor Brown has said, I'll just go through a roll call. Can you just confirm that you are uh, in attendance? So Councillor Brown. Yes. Councillor Allen is currently absent. Councillor Bryant. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Derbyshire. Present. Thank you. Councillor Houston. <coughs> Present. Thank you. Councillor Hunter. Present. Councillor Levitt. Councillor Levitt. Present. Thank you. Councillor Moody. Present. Councillor Nguala. Present. And can I also give um, Councillor Allen's apologies, please? Sure, that's received. Uh, Councillor Prendergast. Uh, yep, present. Thank you. Councillor Rice. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Tyson. Present. Thank you. And officers, Simon Ellis. Present. Tom Ray. Present. Thank you. And Niranetta Katavu. Present. And the public, uh, Councillor Albert. Yes. Councillor Morris. Present. Ian Barker. Present. And James Graham. Present. Thank you. So I'll just go through proceedings for this evening. The meeting is being streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel and Zoom. If live stream fails, the meeting will adjourn. If the live stream cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a time and date fixed by the chair. If the chair does not fix the date, the remaining business will be considered at the next ordinary meeting. If for any reason the meeting is not court, an officer will notify attendees by interjecting the meeting and the meeting will adjourn immediately. Once the meeting is court, the meeting will resume. If connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a time and date fixed by the chair. If the chair does not fix a date, the remaining business will be considered at the next ordinary meeting. If a remote member loses connection, the chair may adjourn the meeting for a short period to enable connection to be re-established. If the chair does not adjourn the meeting, the member will be deemed to have left the meeting at the point of failure and be deemed to have returned at the point of re-establishment. Only members present for the entirety of a debate and the consideration of an item are entitled to vote. If technology fails for a member of the public who attends to participate and is unable to do so, the chair may decide to adjourn or proceed to the next item of business to allow for connection to be re-established. If connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, the chair can decide to conclude the remaining business. If a, member, if a member or member of the public drops out of the meeting and is unable to connect by, by video, an email has been sent to each of you with telephone options. Please ensure that your electronic devices are muted and please activate the mute button on your tablet or computer when you are not speaking. You'll be invited to address the planning control committee by the chair. If a member wishes to speak, they should use the raise hand button, which is located under participants, and this will alert the host that you wish to speak. The host will inform the chair of the names of the speakers who should wait to be invited by the chair to address the planning control committee. Please do not use the hand, uh, the reactions hand symbol. And please can I remind you that the normal procedure rules in respect of debate and times to speak will apply. And if, if any of the officers need to address the Planning Control Committee at any point during proceedings, may I request that you respectfully interject and await a response before addressing the chair. 
In terms of voting, when satisfied there has been sufficient debate, the chair will request that the relevant planning officer read out the recommendation that members will be voting upon. And when requested to vote, voting will be via the green tick for yes, red cross for no, and blue raise hand for abstain, which are all located in the participant section at the bottom of the screen. To enable the votes to be counted, please do not clear your vote until requested to do so. Details of how members voted will not be kept or minuted unless a recorded vote was requested or an individual request that their vote be recorded, and it will not be heard or seen on the audio and YouTube recordings of the meeting. And the committee member and scrutiny officer, which is me tonight this evening, will, will clearly state the result of the vote and the chair will proceed to the next agenda item. And in the event of a tight vote, the chair will have the casting vote. And that's all the information. Is there any questions before I hand over to the chair? Okay, Chair, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So item one, apologies for absence. We have Daniel, Councillor Daniel Allen, I believe. Um, item two, notification of any other business. There is none. So item three, Chair's announcements. Um, in accordance with Planning Control Committee policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be made available to view on ModGov and the film recording via the NHDC YouTube channel. Uh, declarations of interest. Uh, members are reminded that any declarations of interest in respect of any business set out in the agenda should be declared as either a disclosable pecuniary interest or declarable interest and are required to notify the chair of the nature of any interest declared at the commencement of the relevant item on the agenda. Members declaring a disclosable pecuniary interest must withdraw from the meeting for the duration of the item. Members declaring a declarable interest wishing to exercise a councillor speaking right must declare this at the same time as the interest move to the public area before speaking to the item and then must leave the room before the debate and vote. To clarify matters for the registered speakers, members of the public have five minutes for each group of speakers, i.e. five minutes for objectors, five minutes for supporters, and in addition to this, member advocates have five minutes. A bell will sound at four and a half minutes to alert the speakers that they have 30 seconds left, and again, at five minutes, the bell will sound to signify that they must stop speaking. We have quite a short agenda tonight, but if the meeting is to go on beyond nine o'clock, we will take a comfort break at nine. So public participation. There are, there are four registered speakers that have already been confirmed during the roll call tonight under items uh, seven and eight, I believe. So let's move on then to item five, which is our first agenda item. And it's 200895 FPH, Hindsmount, Maidencroft Lane, Godsmore. It's a single story rear extension. This one has come to the planning committee because the applicant is a member. So I'm now just gonna hand over to Tom Ray, the planning officer to present the item. Thank you, Chair, and good evening to members of the committee. Um, could I um, just go through the updates, Chair, for this uh, particular item? Thank you, yes. Um, so the, the um, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, there aren't any updates on this particular item, so I'll just go straight to the slides. Uh, could I have slide, uh, the first slide, please? Thank you. So um, this slide shows the um, general location of Heinz Mount and the surrounding development. Um, the property is close to the centre of the village, including the village green, which is seen here just to the right hand side of the application site. Currently, all of the village is washed over by the green belt designation in the local plan. However, the built up part of the village, including this site, is proposed to be excluded from the green belt and the village is to be categorised as a Category A village within which development will be allowed. Next slide, please. This is the front elevation of the dwelling. 
uh, Heinz Mount, as seen from Maidencroft Lane. It shows the original house and a side extension. The building is grade two. Next slide, please. This is the, this, um, the side elevation of the property uh, and showing a 1970s extension. Um, next slide, please. This shows the, um, the rear of the property. Um, this is the elevation where the extension is to be proposed. Next slide, please. This plan uh, is a location plan for the site. It shows how the, the site is integrated with the village, being surrounded by residential properties uh, on all sides, including a residential property opposite the site. Next slide, please. This shows the, the location of the extension at the back of the property, facing onto um, the rear and the side gardens. The drawing illustrates that the extension is some distance from any of the adjoining properties. Next slide, please. Uh, these drawings show the existing elevations and the existing ground floor plan. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the proposed drawing showing the proposed extension shaded in green to the back of the property. The extension would represent approximately 25% increase to the ground floor of the house. The extension is of a traditional parapet roof design with timber framing and timber windows. The extension, in my view, would not be harmful to the openness of the green belt, giving it relatively small scale and the location of the property within the built up part of the village. No objections are raised by the council's conservation officer, and therefore, Chairman, I would ask the committee to support the recommendation as set out. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no registered speakers for this item, so we can move straight to the debate. Would anyone like to speak? Not seeing any hands. Ah, oh, Councillor David Levitt. Uh, move the recommendation, Chairman. Okay, thank you. I have another hand up, Morgan Derbyshire. Happy to second, Chairman. Okay, so we have a proposer and a seconder. I also have, uh, Mike, were you waiting to speak? Uh, I was going to second. But okay. Morgan's already done it, so. Okay. And is there anybody else that would like to speak before we move to the vote? No, it doesn't look like it. Um, in which case, uh, let's move to the vote. So you need to click the yes button for yes, the red button for no, or if you want to abstain, you raise the hand. Okay, Chair, that's, that's carried 11 votes. Well, that's got to be one of the fastest items we've done. Okay, so let's move on to item six. This is the same property, um, Hines Mount, Maidencroft Lane, Gosmore again, uh, 200896 LBC. And this is for consent for listed, listed building because it's a grade two listed building. It needs listed building consent for this single story rear extension. So it's the same extension, but it's, a, it's the listed building consent. Um, can I ask Tom Ray, please, to introduce the item? Thank you, Chair. Uh, there are no updates for this item, um, and the slides are the same as the previous uh, application. Thank you. There are no registered speakers, so can we please move to the debate? I've got Mike Rice. I'm happy to move this to the vote. And I've got Councillor Morgan Derbyshire. Happy to second again, Chair. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Can't see anyone at the moment. OK, I suggest we move to the vote then. OK, Chair, that's carried 11 votes. Thank you. So we move on to item seven. 
1A Kings Road, Hitchin, Hertfordshire, uh, 20 slash 00865 FP. This is a res residential development of five units comprising one times a two bed flat and four times one bed flats together with associated bike storage, bin storage and amenity space following the demolition of existing MOT garage. And I believe this has come to the committee because Councillor Albert has called it in. Um, can I ask uh, Tom Ray again to present the item and to give us any updates as well? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, there are two updates on this particular item. Um, the first one is a further comment I received um, from the Council's Strategic Infrastructure and Project Manager. And the second one is from the Highway Authority. Um, the Council's Project Manager um, has had a, a closer look at this scheme and uh, advises that it may be necessary to retain the double yellow lines in front of the application site. And the reason for this is to provide adequate turning and circulation space for vehicles using the garages which are opposite the application site, the other side of King's Road. Um, the officer advises that um, having sufficient circulation space here is, is, is quite important because of the narrowness of the carriageway and the um, quite intensive use of those garages. And if this wasn't able to happen, then that may result in objections um, from the garage operators, but also perhaps from local residents. Um, the officer also advises in respect of the existing double yellow lines that um, they actually do um, allow space for vehicles to pull in uh, in the event of oncom oncoming traffic. As um, once a car has turned into Kings Road, off Nightingale Road, the driver is then committed um, to their journey down the road and the current yellow lines either side of the garages uh, allow the opportunity for a driver to pull in if required. Therefore, the um, project manager advises that the double yellow lines should be retained for access and highway safety and convenience reasons. And secondly, Chair, the um, Hertfordshire Highways officer has um, been reconsulted following these comments and has also advised that in their opinion the current parking restrictions i.e the double yellow lines should should remain that's all in terms of updates chair so if i can now move straight to the slides please yes please do right um, the first slide um shows the location of the of the site in Kings Road. Um, it's located about 25 metres from the junction with Nightingale Road and comprises an existing MOT and vehicle repair garage. Next slide, please. This is the front elevation of the existing garage. The business has been established here for yeah, at the rear of number one. Kings Road, which has been converted into flats. And there's a taxi control centre, which also um, uses this access. That's a two storey building. And you can see it here in the background with the green cladding. Also to note, um, here is the double yellow lines in front of the garage building. Next slide, please. This slide shows the the application site on the right and with a view down Kings Road and the other garage premises opposite the site on the left. All of the garage premises have double yellow lines in front of them. Um, also to the left in this photograph, a bit further down, is a three-storey residential development um, which is granted planning permission in 1999. Next slide, please. This is um, a view from outside the site, looking back towards the A505 Nightingale Road. It does illustrate one of the problems caused by the garages, and that is the occasional parking of commercial vehicles in the restricted parking zone. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slightly more clear photograph of the access way to the taxi office to the north and the rear of the site. Uh, next slide, please. This photograph shows the new block adjacent to the William Moss building on the corner of Kings Road. Um, it's a three-storey building, similar in design as the proposed development, particularly with reference to the use of 
red brick and a rendered a front gable feature on the front elevation as, as shown in this photograph. Next slide, please. This photograph shows the, the adjacent William Moss building um, and the access way to its car park, which separates it from the application site. Flats in this block at ground and first floor level have windows on three sides of the building, two elevations of which are facing away from the proposed development, that is towards Kings Road and to the rear of the site towards the petrol filling station. Next slide, please. It's a further photograph of the front of the application site um, and the absence of any parking in front of the building as a result of the, the parking restrictions. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows a closer view of the development at 5967 Kings Road, which is a full three storeys development and of considerable uh, length along Kings Road, almost directly opposite the application site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, moving on to the plans for the development. Um, this is the existing layout of the site. The, the garage premises covers the, the full depth and the entire width of the site at present. Next slide, please. These are the existing floor plans and the elevations of the garage uh, premises. Uh, next slide, please. Plan shows the proposed layout of the site for the new residential block. Um, uh, unlike the existing building, the, the flat block does not fill the entire plot, but allows for a 45 square meter open amenity area at the rear of the site where it uh, boundaries the petrol filling station. Next slide, please. Uh, this drawing uh, shows the floor plans and the elevations of the, the new block. Um, you can see from the street scene drawing down towards the bottom left of the drawing, uh, the gaps that are maintained between the William Moss building on the right and number one Kings Road on the left. The, the block will um, comprise of four one-bedroom flats and one two-bedroom flat. The, the new building would be approximately one metre higher than number, King, uh, number one Kings Road, but it would, as you can see from this drawing, will be slightly lower than the existing William Moss building. On the, on the flank elevation to the north, the applicant has agreed to amend the plans to install obscure glazing in the bedroom windows to flats two and four, which face northwards. The obscure glazing would be up to an internal height of 1.5 metres between finished floor level and the sill of the window, above which there would be a clear glazed element to the window. The windows to these rooms have also been changed from side hung casements to top hung, top hung windows only. The block itself will be mainly red brickwork uh, to be in keeping with the predominant external material uh, in the street. Thank you, Chair. That completes my summary of the proposals and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, so we have two registered speakers. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask Tom Ray questions later, but first of all, I would like to invite the first of our registered speakers, Ian Barker, to make his presentation. You have Chair, five thank minutes. Chair, thank you. Uh, Kings Road is a small road running in a northerly direction off Nightingale Road in Hitchin. Uh, on the corner, as you've seen, is the William Moss building on three floors. Next comes the proposed development. And on the other side of that is the start of terraced housing, which runs all down the street. There's the narrow taxi entrance again that you've seen. Uh, and the first premises at one Kings Road after the proposed development is on three floors. But importantly, one of those floors is very largely basement. The remaining uh, terrace properties are ground and first floor as one goes down that side of the street. I live at number three, which is the first property in the road with a garden. The proposed development is on three floors and the intention is to build a diffraction just under the height of William Moss building on the corner. And it will be a higher construction than the next residential property at One Kings Road. The view from the property to my premises will be from the north elevation and there'll be windows on the first and second floor, which you've, uh, which you've seen, which give a very clear and considerable overlook into my garden and to such an extent as it will be profoundly intrusive. Now that can be seen from a photograph, which I understand you've kindly indicated can be circulated and which Councillor Ian Albert kindly took on a site visit. Um, this picture was taken from the middle of my garden, looking towards the existing premises on the site to be developed. 
uh, chair, I don't know whether that's available um, for people to see on the screen uh, now. If it can be, that'd be grand. But what it will show is that um, there's a, a large brick wall which can be seen. That's effectively the site to be, de um, to be built on. And it shows the rear of the property at number one Kings Road. Now, importantly from that, remember the height of number one Kings Road is lower than the height of the proposed developments. And to have an impression of the overlook, you simply have to imagine the rear of the property at one Kings Road turned round through 90 degrees, effectively to face the garden. Now that represents a very considerable overlook indeed. I understand the planning officer contacted the developer to see if they were prepared to make modifications to alleviate the problem. Uh, and in my discussion with the planning officer, he seemed to entertain the possibility of a high window to let in natural light, but prevent overlook. The developer wasn't prepared to agree that. He's made the minor change that you've heard, obscure glass at the bottom half of the windows on, on the first and second floor, but nothing else. Overlook is still enabled. Let's face it, most people standing at a window will be above its halfway height. My neighbor at Four Kings Road is similarly affected um, and profoundly concerned at the degree of intrusion. He didn't get a letter notifying him of the proposed development, but he's made clear that he has the same view that I do, that it's very intrusive, and he's asked me to pass that on. Please, let me reassure you, this isn't a case of nimbyism. I re recognize fully the desirability of appropriate building on the site, and I'm not saying not in my backyard. I'm simply asking that the windows at the rear of the property on the north elevation should not allow very close inspection of everything in my backyard. What I'm also asking for is a degree of consistency with the rest of the houses on that side of the street. My other circulated picture was taken from the same spot in my garden, but looking at the rear of the premises, which then run to the north. So um, in the photo um, that you see, you'll see properties at four, five, six and seven. And interestingly, the section uh, of terracing at six and seven has been extended on its first floor. And there's no window on that side of the extension. The only window in that side elevation is in the corner where overlook simply isn't possible. And all of the properties in Kings Road on this side appear to be of this nature. My neighbor at number four was told when making a planning inquiry about a first floor extension at the rear of his property, that he wouldn't be permitted to have a window on the extension at that side. And it appears quite properly there's been concern that any such extension shouldn't enable overlook. The proposed development has two windows which extend back much more significantly, and not just on the first floor, but the second floor as well. And it'll be obvious from the photographs that they allow a very considerable overlook of a type simply not enabled anywhere else on Kings Road on that side. In short, having windows of this nature overlooking gardens will be out of character with the rest of the properties, and for me and my neighbour, profoundly and unfairly so. May I ask you to impose a restriction which would prevent the very considerable overlook not present anywhere else? If the planning officer thought it reasonable to raise with the developer the idea of a narrow window at the top to prevent overlook, but to allow light in, that suggests a sensible alternative. An alternative, if the windows are at normal room level, the entirety of the windows could be opaque. The developer may say that previous planning permission was granted, but the developer makes a new application now and does, it does, enable a chair. It does enable a reconsideration by this committee of what would be appropriate at this site. You're not bound by any previous planning permission. You're able to look again and reflect whether in each regard it's reasonable. And there is one aspect of the proposal, I say, which isn't reasonable, and which could easily be re remedied by an appropriate restriction that wouldn't materially impact on the developer's proposal. So may I urge the committee to apply that limited but important restriction. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, before we um, go to members' questions, is there any chance, Matthew, of showing those two photos or is that not possible? Sorry, Chair, the photos in the PowerPoint? No, no the photos that, um, that our public speaker was referring to that have been sent to all councils. Is there any chance of showing those? Or um, Unfortunately not, because I'd have to log off on here. Sorry. OK. All right. I just wanted to ask that first. OK, thank you. Let's um, move to questions then. Do members have any questions to ask of our public speaker? Any questions? Councillor David Levitt. Good evening, uh, Mr. Barker. Um, evening, when the previous application came to us, did you live in your property then and did you raise any objections on the overlooking at that point? The short answer is no, I didn't. And so, no, I couldn't. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Mike Rice. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Barker. Um, when you look out the rear of your property 
can you not see into the gardens next door at all? Um, no, I can't. I have opaque glass at the back. Um, if I did have clear glass, um, I would. And of course, I fully recognise that at the rear of a property, it's reasonable to, to have overlook. Um, my concern is simply uh, having that at the side as well. Obviously, overlook from the rear is more limited. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Are there any other questions for Mr. Barker? No, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. You can turn off your video and sound now. Um, I'd like to invite now Councillor Ian Albert as a uh, member advocate to speak for up to five minutes on this item. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Committee, for agreeing to make for me making this short response to the planning application. Fully appreciate the time of the committee is precious, and I certainly didn't call in the application lightly. Followed discussion with residents in the very immediate area, and not just those who received a formal letter from the council. And also clearly spoke to the main objector, Mr. Barker, who spoke earlier, and has provided you with. Uh, provide you with some detail and some photographs for your consideration. Hitchin, like all of our towns, does need further residential accommodation. No one I've spoken to in Kings Road disagrees with this. They fully recognise that the development both near to the station and near the town is desirable, but it still has to be the right development. I'm sure it can also be said that the potential swap of a MOT garage for a residential development may not be a bad exchange, this is why it's not being argued that the development shouldn't go ahead at all. Mr. Barker set out in his objection and, and in the written submission at some of the key concerns, and I fully endorse those points. But I'll also address a further issue on the subject of the lack of parking a little bit later. The planning officer recognises that the new building is considerably higher than the existing building, but believes it is acceptable due to other similar developments ne nearby. But these developments had relatively minimal impact upon residents in Kings Road in terms of that level of intrusiveness. This development does have a significant impact upon residents and I do believe will be intrusive. Now, one obvious solution is simply that the building is not as high, one floor lower, for example. The committee could consider this as an alternative, but we do recognize other buildings and obviously the planning officer mentioned the William Moss building near, nearby are, and, and also a similar development in Kings Road, do have three floors. So I recognise the practicalities around that. However, the planning officer did discuss with the applicant about the potential intrusion. Um, the proposed resolution to this obscured glass on the bottom half doesn't resolve anything in my view. It would appear the planning officer did discuss the possibility of a high window to let in sufficient light but not allow overlook. This would only apply to windows at the rear, flats two and four, as was mentioned. There's no obvious reason why the plans couldn't be changed in this way. The committee should consider making this change to the plans. Such a compromise and a decision would be of benefit to the nearby residents, while not infringing significantly on the plans of the applicant. Another alternative is that the whole of the overlooking window should be opaque. I feel this is a less good outcome, but would meet the objections being raised. And just to add to the strength of this proposal, it would sit well with and be consistent with what has generally been agreed elsewhere in Kings Road, the avoidance of significant overlook. Planning officer does make reference to a previous planning permission. Clearly that's a fact, but obviously as Mr. Barker has said, we shouldn't place undue reliance on this. And this in practice is a new application and she should be looked upon afresh in this light, if you excuse the pun. Finally, could I turn briefly to the parking issues mentioned in 4.3.14 in the paper. This sets out the guidance about car-free developments and where reductions in park parking standards may be appropriate. The planning officer concludes that since the majority of her flats are one bedroom, it's unlikely that any significant further congestion would occur. I strongly disagree. Whenever an issue of this kind comes up in this area of Hitchin and a development of this size, it is always argued by planning that just one more development won't make a difference. As a result, planning applications get agreed, but step by step, the congestion worsens. I wish it was true that the accessibility to the station and the town automatically means a resident will say they don't need a car, but we know this is still a long way from being the case. Yes, we've declared a climate emergency. Yes, we are encouraging a switch to sustainable transport, 
But in each and every development, we agree like this. It does put further strain on congestion in the area. Now, I fully admit, I can see both sides of this issue. And indeed, in the lifetime of this development, things may have changed significantly. But, and here I may be unfair to the applicant, for which I apologise, developments in this area are usually end up, perhaps with the William Moss building, I think, the, being an exception, are usually car-free to maximise profits by increasing the numbers of flats half minutes, chair. rather than for sustainable transport reasons. The planning officer mentions the possibility of removing the double yellow lines, but we've now seen that's not an option that's been taken off, off the table. Um, so I do believe it would be good if the applicant could have provided an answer why they can't provide parking. In conclusion, I hope the committee will be prepared to take on board the issue of the overlook and agree some further conditions and restrictions. And I also hope you'll consider the parking issues more broadly. Whether this one development breaks the camel's back is debatable, but to ignore it is no answer either. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Albert. Um, you can switch off now. Um, I'd like to invite Tom Ray to respond to any of the issues that have been raised by our speakers. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, yeah, if I could just say a couple of words. Um, just on uh, comments made by Mr. Baker, um, I, I acknowledge Mr. Baker's concerns about the, the height of the development, um, although I, I just refer again to the, the fact that um, this needs to be seen in the context of the surrounding development in the area. And this should include the three story houses opposite at numbers 50, 59 to 67 um, Kings Road, which you, you saw there on one of the slides, as well as the height of the William Moss building. Um, in relation to the overlooking issue, uh, again, I think this needs to be considered in the context of the immediately surrounding buildings. Um, particularly those that already impact on Mr. Baker's property. And if I could just draw members' attention to one of the slides which showed the taxi office. I um, can't remember which slide it was. Um, it was at the back of the alleyway between the um, application building and number one Kings Road. Um, you'll see on that taxi office, um, it has clear glazed windows at first floor level directly overlooking the rear of numbers one and three Kings Road. Um, also, one of Mr. Baker's photographs shows the um, the uh, uh, the uh, flank wall of the existing garage. It, um, it also shows um, the um, if you look at the right hand top right hand corner of that photograph, um, the flat conversion at number one Kings Road, where there is uh, quite a considerable overlooking from uh, windows up to uh, second story level and a fire escape. Um, uh, Chair, just, just a point of order, please, that the committee does not have access to the photos to which the planning officer is referring to from Mr. Parker. OK, I did ask if they could be shown. Um, we should all have been sent them. Were you not sent them by earlier by Matthew? He sent them out by email, I think. That's yes, correct, Chair. Chair. They... I've received them. I've certainly received them. I'm looking at them now. Can you? So they should be available to all the members. I'm, the chair, gonna, I'm going to invite chair, Tom to continue, I think. So uh, if members could see that photograph, they'll see the top right hand corner, the overlooking I'm talking about from the flat conversion, which is already there. Uh, to Mr. Baker's property, but notwithstanding that, I think it's absolutely reasonable not to add to this overlooking um, with this development, which is why I've negotiated with the developers to add more obscure glazing. And this obscure glazing will be to a height of 1.5 meters above internal floor level. And the window openings have been changed from casement openings to uh, you know, uh, side opening casements to top hung windows as, as well. So I think these changes do actually virtually eliminate any casual overlooking from the flats to Mr. Baker's property. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's now move to the debate then. I've got Councillor Hunter waiting to speak. Sorry, Chairman, for the delay. 
uh, originally I put my hand up just to confirm that I've got both photographs sent to us by Matthew in the email. Um, but I think uh, the officers just answered my question because I wanted to check on this obscure glass and what type of windows they were. And I think he mentioned in his um, brief explanations that they're top and windows now rather than the standard casement. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Councillor Hewson. Thank you, Chair. And just a quick question for the officer. Um, would any parking concerns not be balanced out with the removal of the garage itself? Okay. Tom Ray, would you like to answer that? I don't know whether he's here. You scared him off. Maybe let's come back to that. Oh, are you there? Okay. Would you like to answer that, Tom? Yes, yeah, certainly. The uh, thank you, Chair. Certainly, the the garage um, does cause some congestion with um, uh, uh, um, delivery vehicles. I think I showed one of, an example of that uh, in one of the slides. Okay. Has that answered your question, Councillor Hewson? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Levitt waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I do now have those photographs. Uh, I have picked my emails up from this morning now, so I've seen the photographs now. Um, did we, when we were talking about the windows and the, we say the developers agreed to have the half, half obscured ones, I don't actually see any condition that uh, makes that enforceable within the um, recommendations at all. So um, although it's in the plans it's it's not a condition we normally condition something like that um however i do take the point that um probably they should be fully obscure um rather than half obscure one and a half meters is about chin height for most people so you can quite easily look over the top um so i think they either got to be uh obscure up to 1.8 metres, which is the top of a normal person's head, or totally obscure. And I think that should be, whatever we decide on that, should be conditioned. Um, I'd actually make a proposal, an amendment to include a condition that they're fully obscure. Um, the sec second point I want to make is about the parking. Um, I take Councillor Albert's view about, yes, it is a very congested area around there. Um, I see the point about the double yellow lines, because if you took those away, you wouldn't get around that corner most times. So, um, and you certainly would not get out the garages. However, just around the corner in Nightingale Road is a public car park owned by North Hertfordshire District Council, which is what I think it's the only free car park we have left now. Um, it has 20 spaces. June, it is limited to three hours parking all day, but it is open 24 hours a day. Um, I would make a suggestion that if uh, after six, if there is a lot of people with cars, they would they would tend to be there in the evenings rather than the daytime. Um, so perhaps we could look at the opening hours of that car park in the evening to allow people to park overnight. Now, um, that may be one way around it. Um, but certainly um, it is a sustainable development. It is close to the station. Um, there's probably less vehicles going to be using it than the, you see going in and out of the current garage, um, which doesn't have parking on site apart from inside the garage itself. Thank you, Councillor Levitt. Um, I'm going to take the next speakers that are waiting and then we'll come back to your amendment if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so can I invite Councillor Bryant to speak? Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, Councillor, that I didn't hear everything, all you said about parking because you froze. But I went to visit the site today, which is an area I know very well. And parking is a real problem. But where the, in, in terms of the garage parking, the lorry you saw, usually those spaces will actually be used by uh, customers visiting the shops across the road on Nightingale Road. 
you've got several takeaways there and a mini market that have no parking themselves. I've spoken at length with the residents of Kings Road other occasions and basically terraced houses you've got the equivalent of one car space per house if you're good at parking. Now yes there is the free car park just along the road but when I went visited today there were two free spaces there. It's only three hours and can I remind the committee that it was only last meeting I think where we actually passed the an application for Dacre Road, which also assumed use of those spaces in that car park. And so what I would ask the committee to think about is whether we're actually using the same spaces in the car park over again and actually causing the parking in the area to be intolerable for residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brand. I've got Councillor Nguala waiting. Oh yes, um, thank you. I just wanted to ask about the obscured windows and I was just thinking about what it would be like to live in one of those flats. So if you were in one of the one bedroomed flats and you had obscured windows, perhaps this is a, a question to the planning officer, um, which windows would it be? And would it feel like sitting, you know, in a one bedroom flat, would it feel like sitting in a bathroom? You know, I can't think that's a very nice outlook, really. Can I invite the planning officer to respond? Thank you, Chair. Um, just on that point, yeah, these um, the flats concerned are um, two one-bedroom flats, and this window is to the is to the, the bedroom. Um, there are uh, other clear glazed windows in other parts of the flats, in including the kitchen and dining room on the opposite side of the building. Um, obscure glazing, total obscure glazing to a bedroom is not ideal, um, but it would allow uh, reasonable light levels still. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? I've got Councillor Hunter, but um, you've already spoken once. Were you planning to... Uh... Apologies, Chairman. I'll take my hand down. Okay, Questions thank you. Hunter. It's, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Okay, let's go back to the amendment that was proposed by Councillor Levitt. Could you just remind us exactly what the amendment is? Certainly, Chair. It is to add a condition to the uh, grant of application to say that the windows are fully obscured glazing. Okay, thank you. Do we have a seconder for that amendment? Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Chairman, happy to second that. Okay, so can we put the amendment to the vote? So we're voting on the amendment of the, about the obscure windows. everybody voted. Sorry? Sorry. sorry. No, that's right. I, was gonna, I didn't realise Matthew was... It's fine. I was just going to say, yep. I, it looked like a tie to me, but I was yes, going to confirm with it, um, Matthew. It's yes, a tie. So, tie it's vote. A so, wall. so I need to vote then? Yes, we need a chairman's casting yes. vote, please. Oh, gosh, that, that's putting me in a lot, <laughs> lot of pressure <laughs> there, isn't there? Well, I'm, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll vote yes then. Okay. So okay. the amendment is carried. Mm -hmm. With the chairman's so vote. Yeah. So the condition. So now we need to vote on the substantive item with that amendment. Um, so we can we put that to the vote, please.
Okay, so that's carried, that's yes. <clears throat> okay, so the, uh, the motion is carried with the additional condition of the additional obscured windows that um, as per the amendment. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on then to item eight. Uh, this is the Tally Ho London Road Barkway 200627S73. Um, this is a two story rear extension to provide in large kitchen and ground floor and additional residential accommodation on first floor. This is a section 73 application to vary a condition of the planning permission that was granted previously under reference 05004691 to allow ancillary res residential accommodation for the public house, but not for any op additional operation floor space in connection with the public house. So um, we're, we're not, the, the extension's already been built, but we're just looking at a cha uh, uh, removing the condition that previously meant that the uh, enlarged kitchen space could only be used for food preparation. So it restricted it to food preparation. It didn't allow it to be used as a living space. Um, so I'd like to now hand over to Simon Ellis, the planning officer to present the item and any updates. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Um, just one update before I go to the slides. Uh, the chair asked me to just update the members on the um, asset of community value. Um, the asset of community value was um, created in uh, on 7th of September 2016, and it expi expires on the 7th of September 2021. So there's still just over a year to go before the, the current asset of community value registration on this premises needs to be renewed. Uh, can I turn to the slides now, please? Can I have the next slide, please? So we don't actually have any photographs for this um, application because we're not actually dealing with, um, we're not looking at a proposed development. We're looking at, a, as, as the chair said, a, a variation of a condition proposal. So the first slide just shows you the um, location of the Tally Ho pub on the uh, right hand side of London Road or High Street in Barkway on the southern side of the village. Can we have the next slide please? This is the old location plan showing you the, the pub and the car park in that location. And then the next slide please. There is actually no need to provide plans for Section 73 applications because it's not about a proposal. However, this shows you the um, applicant's intention uh, to use uh, the ground floor premises as living accommodation. But this is the, I think this is the slide from the original plan which shows you the kitchen prep area. So we can have the next slide, please. So yeah, that's the proposed plan, although, as I said, it wasn't necessary to show that in the application, but it's just showing the applicant's genuine intention. They want to convert that kitchen prep area into ancillary living accommodation for the family who would run the pub. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, this is a bit of a grainy picture. This is showing you the approved plan of the 2005 Planning Commission for the extension itself. It's showing you the original layout of the pub and then you can see the quite large extension that was added in two, after 2005, two-story extension, and you can see the ground floor there, and then the, the, the two bedrooms in the first floor. So that just gives you an overall illustration as to what the intention is. The, the condition from 2005, its purpose was to um, restrict the use of the uh, ground floor to kitchen preparation area only, and the main reason for that was because in 2005, we had um, maximum, sorry, no, minimum car parking standards. And what was felt at that time is that if you allowed the bar area to, in, to be encroached into that extension on the ground floor, you'd have such a large public house that, that it might overflow the car park. So that was the original intention for that condition. The, the intention of the condition was nothing to do with um, 
residential occupancy or anything like that. It was simply to restrict that area on the ground floor to only be used for kitchen preparation area. So if you look at paragraph 4.3.11, um, that tells you that since 2005, there's been a complete change in how you look at car parking standards. We've gone from minimum standards for commercial premises to maximum standards, which is aimed to reduce reliance on the private car so that people visiting um, commercial premises are encouraged not to use the private car. And that's why we have maximum car parking standards. So because you've changed, flipped the emphasis completely the other way around from 2005 from minimums to maximums, the purpose of that restriction on not being able to use the ground floor as public house space has, has been completely over, over, overcome by the fact that car parking is now looked at a completely different way. Um, so with a section 73 application, the proposal is actually to vary the wording of the um, condition, but you have three options available. You can either refuse planning permission to change the condition at all, keep it as it is. You can um, grant planning permission for the wording that the applicants put forward, or you can go with our recommendation, the officer recommendation, which is to remove the condition altogether. We don't think it's necessary to have a condition that restricts the use of the ground floor premises, or you can vary it along some other lines as you see fit. Um, however, um, all conditions that you do impose need to be reasonable. And if you look at paragraph 4.3.14, um, the case officer there highlights the tests that you need to apply to any conditions that you do impose. So they need to be reasonable and necessary and relevant to planning and precise and enforceable. So those are the, there's, there's the six tests that he's outlined in there. Our view is that if you remove the condition, and that's what our recommendation is, do you go even further than what the applicant's asking for? And our, our view is that you just take the condition out altogether, is that you're giving a lot more operational freedom to any to the current owners or to any subsequent owners. As you know, planning permissions run with the land. So I wouldn't advise you to be too distracted by what's shown on the intended plans. As I said, those plans didn't need to be submitted. They didn't need to show that they were wanting to use that space for ancillary, res ancillary residential accommodation. To use the space for ancillary residential accommodation is not a material change of use. It's just configuring how they operate within the pub. So it's still retaining the pub, using the ground floor as ancillary residential accommodation, and then the upstairs as the main residential accommodation. But if, we, if you remove the condition completely, it could be used as a kitchen area, it could be used as ancillary residential accommodation, it could use it as extended bar. So we think that if you remove the condition altogether, you're actually giving a lot more operational freedom to the current owner of the pub and to any future um, uh, occupiers and managers of the pub. So that's it for me for the time being, um, but I'll take any questions as the, as the debate continues. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We're gonna, we have two registered speakers for this item, so there'll be opportunity to ask um, Simon questions after that. Um, but I'd like to move to the registered speakers first. So first of all, we have uh, Councillor Gerald Morris is as a member advocate. You have five minutes. Uh, can I come up on the screen, please, before the clock starts? Yes. Could, would you like to, I'd like yeah, you to see me. put your video on? Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Yes, that's great. We can um, all see. Before you start the clock, as I said, I've, had, I've shortened my submission because it was going to take about eight minutes. So you'd all have been falling asleep by then. So anyway, this is it. Uh, this, is, this application is to subdivide part of the ground floor pub business so that it becomes part of the residential accommodation of this registered community asset. Most villagers that have spoken to me, and indeed most parish councillors are concerned that the tally -ho does not repeat what is happening to the cabinet pub in the adjacent village of Reed. There the owner had converted the entire building into a house without permission. Then because of a planning refusal and appeal dismissal, then submitted an application similar to the tally -ho to subdivide that pub into ground floor, part residential and part wet trade only bar. That application was refused by NHDC in April 2019. Moving on, the case officer's report and recommendation, paragraph 4.2.1, states the reason for this application, and I paraphrase, to ensure that too many customers do not use the pub and thus overburden the pub car parking. Also, that this would be detrimental 
to the overall character and appearance of the area. It's rather strange to intentionally try and make the business less successful. I would suggest that this reasoning is irrelevant and I will come on to that later. The entire ground floor area of this pub, including its kitchen, has been in business as long as anyone in the village can remember. The drawing shown as existing, which is undated, presumably tries to illustrate the layout when the present owners acquired the pub. However, referring to the case officer's attached approved plan, paragraph 1.2, the second kitchen next to the toilet was in fact part of the restaurant and the bar area next to it was in fact also part of the restaurant. The proposed ground floor plan also shows this kitchen next to the toilets. Since food is not being served, does not appear to be required. Email from the applicant's consultant to the pub of, to the case officer, 3rd of June quotes that this is a wet sales only pub. The case officer also states 4.3.8 that the application is adapting and improving the living conditions of the pers person running this local community facility. The applicant's planning consultant says that the floor, first floor lacks living space. However, as you can see from the approved plan 1.2, the first floor includes two bedrooms, two bathrooms, a living room, and a study office. The existing owners have lived on the first floor for many years. To expand the residential accommodation at the expense of the ground floor pub hardly benefits, as the case officer says, a local community facility. Many villagers have said to me that the owners are setting up the business to fail, perhaps to eventually attempt to use the entire building residentially. The email from their planning consultant dated 3rd of June to the NHDC case officer quotes the landlord and landlady who criticized both myself and the parish council for appearing to have a better understanding of a profitable pub than they do. We were aware, aware of the NHDC refusal, which I've listed below, in respect of the cabinet in Reed, and also the expert opinion below of Anthony Miller. Both state that a wet tray pub is not viable. Since the applicant's rationale is based on controlling the intensity of use of the public house with its limited off-street parking, I would point out that the pub is located at the quiet end of the high street and villagers that use the pub, including myself, would generally walk there and not drive. It would also be used regularly by hikers and cyclists who do not need the car parking. In any event, there is unrestricted parking in the road. Therefore, any attempt to moderate the number of customers and therefore reduce the pressure on parking is completely irrelevant. As any visitor to the pub will see, the number of parking spaces bears no relation to the num relationship to the number of people who may visit. Since the car park entrance is intended to become the sorry, since the yeah, the car park entrance is intended to become the residential entrance, where will wheelchair access be provided? As the committee will know, planning ap applications are judged by their social, economic, and environmental benefit. Reducing the size of the business on the ground floor will be socially detrimental to the enjoyment of the pub as an amenity for the village. Economically, it will be detrimental to the future of the pub and reduce local pub, pub employment. So for the long-term future of the pub and for the majority of local people that would use it, I would ask the committee to kindly refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Sorry. <laughs> yes, you did it in the time. Well done. Um, are there any questions uh, for Councillor Morris? I can't see any hands at the moment. Oh, yes. Councillor Nguala. Sorry, yes. Thank you for the presentation. Councillor Morris, I just wanted to understand that a bit better. Um, so your objection is that they won't be able to serve food. It will be drinks only. And that's detrimental to the to the. Are you worried that the pub might be lost altogether? Uh, absolutely. Well, it's the view of most people, like not everybody, obviously, but most people that I speak to in the village, including most of the people in, on the parish council, are of that op opinion. The, the justification uh, in the application and in the um, case officer's report um, 
is basically yes to stop too many people using the using the car park, which is irrelevant because there's ample parking in the streets anyway. Okay. I'm just a little bit confused, really. Is that a planning consideration that you might lose the pub eventually? <laughs> Probably not. I think we'll come back to that um, when I get Simon to ask, invite Simon to respond. Are there any other questions for Councillor Morris? Thank you very much then. We'll move on to our next speaker and you can disappear if you like, Councillor Morris. Um, so I'd like to invite James, Mr. James Gran to speak to the committee. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, members. I, I speak in support of the application as the applicant's agent. Uh, your officers have provided a thorough and clear report with a recommendation for approval. By way of summary of the application and the issues, uh, the, the original permission for the rear extension was conditioned for the ground floor to remain as kitchen and preparation area, only for no increase uh, and for no increased public seating, drinking or eating facilities with the reasoning being of avoiding pressure on off-site parking. As confirmed in the officer report, the use of the ground floor of the rear extension would, uh, for, for enlarged ancillary residential accommodation, would not increase parking demand at the site and the current provision of 14 spaces is below the maximum required for the current floor space of the building under the current adopted car parking standards. And this would still be the case were the ground floor to be used for in connection with just the public house instead of residential accommodation uh, ancillary to the public house. On this basis, officers are now of the view that the permission should be unconditional and not restrict the use of the ground floor to be residential only, which was our original proposal for this application. This will actually enable the owner to use the space for either ancillary accommodation or for public house use which will only allow increased liability of the pub and not reduce it. Therefore, officers are seeking to allow full flexibility of the ground floor space in the best interests of the long-term viability of this public house. The application needs to be judged on these merits only. The residential use is ancillary to the public house use and would remain so. And even if the ground floor of the extension were changed to habitable residential space, Therefore, the proposal would still support the need for local community facilities through improving the living conditions of the persons running this local community facility. The use of the space as a large kitchen and preparation area is just now no longer required. The owner has sought to provide a quality community facility and it is their full intention to continue with this aim. Instead of a full food offer, just the in terms of the debate so far about um, food being prepared uh, within the building. Instead of a full food offer being prepared in the building, they now provide outside catering services. This has prov proved extremely popular and the ability to offer a diverse range of food at competitive prices is both attractive to passing customers and has enabled them to concentrate on the main source of income, which is actually wet sales. This is exemplified by the trading accounts, which saw a loss of £73,000 in 2017, which was their last year of serving food, which is clearly not sustainable. The following year showed a profit of £23,000, whilst operating as a wet sales only pub. The ceasing of serving food in-house and the significantly reduced associated costs of this speak for themselves. The applicant has no intention of seeking change of use to residential and closing the pub, quite the opposite in fact. They are merely looking to diversify and turn the pub into a profitable business, with the building also providing the applicant's home with some enlarged residential accommodation. Accordingly, I trust you will agree that the application is acceptable for the grant of unconditional planning permission as per the officer recommendation. Thank you. Um, just to finish on the point about the uh, kitchen and the, the current layout of the, the building. There is actually a kitchen uh, in that position shown. It's a small galley kitchen because the owners do still provide some bar snacks 
but they don't offer a full uh, menu uh, for the reasons set out due to the um, loss, serious loss making that this was uh, for the pub due to the high cost of, in, in order to provide that service. And now it's a profitable wet sales only pub. One and a half minutes, Chair. Still provide the, um, the snacks alongside in that small kitchen area. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Grant from members? I have M Councillor Hewson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just curious as to as to what um, uh, Mr. Grant meant by outside catering. Does that mean you can order Domino's and have it delivered to the pub or something like that? They are um, sort of catering uh, vans. Uh, these sort of pop up. Um, facilities like you would sort of see at um, events, uh, weddings, etc., and on small um, uh, or in parks, etc., where they can. There are mobile units. They can offer. Obviously, there's all different types of them. Everything from fish and chips to all different types of cuisine. And they have been uh, operating there, offering a different food offer for customers, both for patrons of the public house, but also for passing trade, I believe, as well. Can you give any examples? Of the food types? Yeah. I don't, I'm afraid, no, but there'll be differing um, different cuisines, which um, the applicant has confirmed offers a variety of choice. Okay, thanks. Can I invite Councillor Tyson to ask a question? Yeah, I just, um, for the avoidance of um, any doubt at all, um, when you mentioned, and I think Mr. Ellis also used the, the phrase, um, use of the ground floor space, and you were talking about um, removing the condition, uh, giving the owner then absolute uh, flexibility um, over the use of that ground floor space, that we are really only talking about the space, the area of the extension, and no other internal area. That's correct, Council. That's correct, Council. Yes, it's just the ground floor of the rear extension space only. It's not nothing to do with the main space of the bar area and the, the, the rest of the public house. Thank you. Councillor Nguala. Yes, I was just going to move that we um, go with the officer's recommendations to dispense with the um, condition completely and allow the applicant to develop his business the way in whichever way he wishes so that he can make a profit. Seems to me these might be quite difficult times for pubs. So um, um, yeah, thank you. We're actually taking questions, questions to the ground at the moment. So you can come back with that when we move okay. to the debate, if that's all right. Um, are there any, is there anyone else waiting to ask a question of Mr. Graham? Okay, thank you for your time, your presentation. Thank you, members. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Simon Ellis, the planning officer, to respond to any of the issues that have been raised by our speakers. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, this is a, a strange one, but the, the Councillor Tyson was absolutely right. Um, we're only looking at the use because we have to refer back to the the planning commission in 2005 which was for the two-story extension and um what the officer recommendation would do is is remove any restriction on the use of the ground floor in the extension which as you can see from the plans is actually quite a big area on the ground floor so if you then allow the applicant and the operator to, to manage the whole of the ground floor as they see fit they could use it as a kitchen area they could use it as a bar area. They could use it as ancillary residential accommodation, which is what they've shown in their plans, but they didn't need to show that in the plans because that in itself is not a material change of use of the premises. So that's the confusion because I think where the parish council and councillor Morris are coming from, when they draw the comparison with the cabinet in Reed, and councillor Morris referred to the refusal of planning commission from 2019, I'll read out the description of that development that he was referring to. It was an explicit proposal. It was called the subdivision of the building to be part retained as a public house and part change of use to a single dwelling house. So what he was trying to do in the cabinet was split it in two 
and have the ground floor as a pub and then the other half of the ground floor as a separate dwelling house. That was a material change of use. What you're being asked to determine here is not a material change of use. You're being asked to determine a variation of a condition or in our view, a complete removal of the condition. So also Councillor Morris referred to the um, intention of the officers when I think what we need to bear in mind, it was the intention of the original condition. The intention of the original condition, as I said at the beginning, was to stop the um, expansion of the public house into the ground floor extension was granted at that time because there was a view that if you did that, you'd have too many visitors coming to the pub and the car park would get over, overwhelmed. So the original intention of the condition was to stop that happening. But as I said earlier, now that car parking standards have gone to maximum standards rather than minimum standards, that entire reason for that condition has been removed altogether. So if the entire reason for the condition has been removed, then why are we seeking to impose a new condition? Are we going to invent a new reason as to why we want to put a restriction on here that wasn't considered back in 2005? So we think it should be simplified, get the condition to remove, remove it altogether, give the current owner and any future owners of the premises to have complete freedom to use the ground floor as they see fit, and be wise that what the, to use that space as ancillary living accommodation is not a material change of use to a separate dwelling. Um, you can't force the current owners to run a kitchen there. You can't say that you can't, that you can't use the space. You can't force someone to use it as a bar. You have to allow them to use their business brain to occupy and run the premises as they see fit. And we shouldn't be putting barriers in front of that, I don't think. But uh, I'll take any further questions as the debate goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the debate. Is there anybody who would like to speak? Councillor Levitt. Thank you, Chairman. Um, wet sales, restaurants, takeaways, bar snacks, it's totally irrelevant to uh, what we consider it as a planning committee. Um, whether it continues as a pub in the future, that's up to the owners and their business model. Um, if it should ever come before this committee to be converted into a, a, a house only, living accommodation only, that's an entirely different matter. Um, as we saw in previous applications, like a red, red line at Western, uh, because the owner hadn't considered alternative methods of serving food and that, that was refused, um, and, and that could happen in the future. But as we stand at the moment, there is no plans that we're aware of to turn it into a house. Um, there appears to be a viable business model there. Um, pubs are in a bit of a state at the moment, particularly isolated pubs like that one. Uh, in the current situation, we were set to lose roughly 40 to 50 percent of our pubs we already have. Um, any model that works for me and something like that is great. Let's encourage it. Um, removing the conditions allows the flexibility. I'm not going to say I'm going to uh, move the recommendation because I know somebody else wants to do that too, so I'll let her do that one. But I would certainly second it if, if Sue's going to propose it. Thank you, Councillor Levitt. I've got Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, th this is very interesting. I think um, some of us on this committee have um, spent a lot of time in committee talking about viability on actual public houses and how they can trade and not trade, um, which is not altogether a planning concision. Uh, can this pub trade successfully as a wet business and will it? Um, that's something uh, that's on the fringes, if you like, of planning. Now, this particular public house, its opening times have been quite erratic over the last year or two. Um, quite often, um, it's meant to be open and it's closed, or it'll open for a couple of hours and close. So I can quite understand the um, financial figures that were reported to us by Mr. Grant. Um, the thing is, though, you've got to say what's disappearing here is the entire restaurant area that was created um, to supply a food facility. Now, one thing we know about restaurants is that they encourage people to come from near and far. So you can actually argue once we've withdrawn that, and yes, if the business proves to be non-viable, 
they can then go for a change of use and actually look at the building being turned into accommodation across the board. Now, personally, I, I don't support the officer's recommendation. And I think um, within Councillor Morris's um, actual paperwork, he did mention about promoting health, healthy and safe communities and quoted um, the MPPF uh, 92 section C, which guard against unnecessary loss of value facilities and services. But I think also you're looking at section D, ensure that established shops, facilities and services are able to develop and modernize and retain the benefits of the community. I, I think this is a very interesting way of looking at things. And obviously our officers are looking at it, eh, if you like, one way as far as planning is concerned. I'm probably looking at it a totally different way, which is community based. And I think probably in an R merging plan, I think it's SPD talks about healthy communities, about support the retention of existing community culture, leisure or recreation facilities. I think the probability is um, if the committee were of a mind to go with our officers, and I'm not, um, I'm in fact, <laughs> inclined to go totally against them and refuse and would put forward that recommendation chairman that we refuse this application because i believe this is the thin end of the wedge and although we have to look at every application as it actually arrives on our desk and we have to take it um, in its whole i think this particular one if we actually were to grant I think we'd be looking at a further application in a year or so uh, to actually turn it into accommodation. Because I think everything I've read about viability on public houses proves categorically that a wet trade pub does not succeed. It actually falls. And that has been the proven case now on a number of reports that have actually gone across our table over the last year. So. Sorry, Chairman, I actually would say to the committee that we actually refuse this particular application. I can't see any other speakers. Um, is there anybody who would be would be prepared to second Councillor Hunter's refusal, recommendation to refuse? Is anybody prepared to second that? I can't see a seconder. Um, presumably, if there's no seconder, we can't vote on that. Is that correct? Correct, Chairman. That is correct. Sorry. Try okay, I've, I've never come across this situation before. Okay, yeah. so we have we have no seconder. Um, so I and um, is there anybody else who would like to speak? If not, I'll invite Councillor Anguala to propose that we grant. Would you like to do that? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to propose that we dispense with the condition completely and allow the applicants to develop the business in order that they can make um, the best profit available to them. And I'm going to invite Councillor Levitt because he, he, he did say before that he was prepared to second it. Happy to second, Chairman. Although I did see some other hands up, so um, I imagine that's what you were planning to do. So um, let's go to the vote then. Okay, that's carried. Uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, Councillor Rice, you had your hand up or did you want to vote? Because I think that's I an abstention, is it not? Yeah, are you abstaining, Councillor Rice? Right, sorry, apologies. Yeah. yeah, okay. So that's carried to Grant. Thank you very much. So let's move on then to item nine, which is planning appeals. I believe there's only one. Uh, would I'd like to invite Simon to present this. Thank you, Chair. I just have one update on appeals. We've um, just received another one, which I will mention because it's just new and it may be of interest. 
but it's not on the list. Just bear with me one moment. Uh, yeah, it's the exchange Queen Street Hitchin. Um, planning permission was refused for a two story roof extension to create four one bed studio apartments and six two bed apartments with 10 allocated car parking spaces. And um, permission was refused for that under delegated powers. And it was design and impact on neighboring residents. And we've just received that appeal and it's written representations. So any ward councillors can add to the, uh, that they can make their comments known to the inspectorate. And we'll be distributing um, information about how you do that in the next few, next few days. That's the only the updates on appeals. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So does that apply to the councillors who, for whom that is in their ward? Written yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, because yeah. they can make their own representations to the to the inspector. OK, so if that's in your ward, you can write. And the other appeal was dismissed, wasn't it? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, I think that is all. So uh, we will close the meeting at 2057 and no comfort break is needed. Thank you very much. <laughs>